City Council approves a plan to save a north side landmark. A suspect wanted on a Canada-wide warrant surrenders to police. And the Senate releases details of the Pamela Wallen audit. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A historic city building that looked destined for the wrecking ball will now be repaired. Just last month, the owner of the Lyceum Theater was ordered to fix up the place or demolish it immediately. But now, a study of the building has determined it's not falling apart as quickly as once believed. Dennis Ward has more. It hasn't even been a month since notices were posted on the Lyceum Theater to fix it up or tear it down. Those orders were based on a report from roughly a year ago that determined the building should come down within 12 months. But the city now has a new engineering study that says things aren't that bad. Council has decided to make some repairs to save the century-old building. There was a problem with the roof. Part of it's going to have to be replaced. And so we're going to work on that in the next few months. Uh, but once we stop the water from coming in there, the rest can be cleaned up. Inside, it's a terrible mess in terms of mold and things like that, but that can be cleaned up. But we have to prevent the water from getting in there, so we've got to repair the roof. And so that's uh, basically the direction we're taking. While the Lyceum is hardly in great condition, it is structurally sound and not unsafe. The private owner, who has been unreachable, currently owes more than $95,000 in back taxes. The city will try again to contact him before any work is done. We're going to place orders on the owner directing under the Property Standards Act that he repair this building. If he fails to comply, then we will move forward and we'll do this work uh, ourselves and we will send him a bill. If he fails to pay the bill, we will put the cost on the taxes. If the taxes remain unpaid, the Lyceum will be available in the 2014 tax sale. Hebert feels the property could be attractive if the proposed event centre goes in right across the street. The Waterfront District BIA, which has been concerned about the condition of the building for years, also feels it could be reused. Whether it's uh, repaired and brought up to standard and sold, or whether the facade is saved, or whatever happens, that it does contribute positively in a positive way to the downtown, and then it does not remain in the condition that it is in currently for any length of, uh, any length of time. Dennis Ward, TBT News. Unlike many other communities, Thunder Bay will not be limiting the number of animals pet owners can have. Councillor Aldo Roberto was calling for a report on restricting the number of cats or dogs a person could keep in their home. While there was some support for the idea, there was also harsh criticism. Jonathan Wilson has more. According to Councillor Aldo Roberto, the hoarding of animals in Thunder Bay is becoming a big issue. He feels the majority of pet owners are loving and caring but he's received complaints about people with 25 to 30 animals. And that's perfectly fine here, as no bylaw exists restricting the number of pets a person can have. But not everyone thought there was a need for a restriction either, including Mayor Keith Hobbs. Where do we draw the line? Some people like pets as uh, their children because they can't have children. And there's some families that have 16 children. So are we going to start uh, legislating how many, people, how many children are in a household? Like, Sorry, Councillor Roberto, I, I totally disagree with this. I think it's a waste of time. Roberto believes a bylaw would protect pets, the public, and the owners, some of whom he says have mental illnesses. City staff say rules are in place to deal with problems with people and pets. Whether that's noise, odor, whatever the case may be, we can deal with those. Um, it's also not possible to legislate away uh, mental illness. So, you know, hoarders and that sort of thing, that, these problems won't go away just because we put in place a bylaw saying don't hoard. They're going to do cats. Roberto's idea to look at pet restrictions was shot down in a tight 6-5 to five vote. Another bylaw that came forward did get full support from Council. The Thunder Bay Regional Hospital is looking to put an end to smoking on its property. Senior staff are asking Council to amend the existing smoking bylaw to include the hospital. We don't plan to be, um, you know, insane about it. Um, we have a start date. Um, it was chosen for a particular reason. Um, we don't suddenly expect on October the 1st that this is going to be a non-smoking area. You know, we're not blinding ourselves to the reality of this. As you say, it's an addictive illness. Council will get a report back next month on the idea. The hospital would like to find people between $200 and $250. Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. Council last night also discussed problems with housing for one segment of the city's population. 
A new report recommends 19 steps that can be taken to improve access to housing for people with substance use issues. Tara Allaire has that story. The Drug Strategy Accommodation Needs Assessment includes 10 short-term priority recommendations that would see people with substance abuse issues accessing the accommodation and support they need. It recommends the creation of a long-term Housing First program in Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay's Drug Strategy Coordinator Cynthia Olson says Housing First was pioneered in New York and has proven successful in several large Canadian cities. Housing First is saying, I'm going to give you a house. No strings attached, but I'm going to make sure that there are services and supports that are available uh, that can be a wraparound. They may be health services, they may be outreach services, but it's going to be tailored to your needs. Um, and you're going to direct what you think your needs are. So, you know, it's important that we address housing um, as far as the drug strategy is concerned because it is a significant risk factor for substance use both ways. The report also calls for the expansion of existing shelter programming, an enhancement of residential rehabilitation services, and an increase in transitional housing. City Manager Tim Camisso praised the report but touched on its cost. Camisso says federal and provincial support is needed to make the expensive proposal a reality. You can't just assume that there's going to be savings in the delivery that can somehow get plowed back because at the end of the day, you know, it's a vicious circle. And again, as a municipality, you know, we are prepared to be a part of this, but it's at the federal level and also the provincial level. And I think the provincial would say that they're, they're engaged where, you know, the, the, the fundamental issue relies with respect to the fact we are dealing with a human service here. We're dealing with something that uh, is broader than any one municipality's capacity to deal with. And we do need to work at, you know, different levels of government to try to address this problem. Tara Allaire, TBT News. Thunder Bay Police are looking to bring their cruisers up to date. At today's Police Services Board meeting, a proposal for new onboard laptop computers was on the table. But a previous plan to install body cameras on police uniforms is now on hold. Courtney Rutherford reports. It's a device that's commonly found in households. It looks like a laptop but built to provide frontline officers with a faster way when it comes to dealing with calls. They're able to pull up uh, any history if they're, say, dispatched to a uh, domestic violence call. They're able to pull up any history on the house, whether there's been a uh, history of domestic violence, whether there's been weapons calls to the, to the house. So it's an officer safety issue. Uh, it also ties in with our, our GPS system for tracking the, the, the cruisers, which again is an efficiency thing as well as an officer safety issue. The 25 laptops that would be installed come in at close to $90,000. The current equipment needs to be replaced, but the Thunder Bay Police have to wait until the city's approval before moving forward. Well, we have a, a policy within the city uh, purchasing department that anything to, to do with a sole source uh, over a certain amount of money has to seek approval of council because we want to make certain that we are in line with our policies and procedures. So we're just following that. And uh, this is one instance that in my uh, experience uh, on the police services board where this has come and uh, we just have to follow the city procedures. The body cams that were brought up at a meeting earlier in the year will be put on hold for a while. Video storage has proven to be an issue and the force is looking further into whether or not they in fact are beneficial. Meanwhile, the police board also agreed to provide $5,000 to develop a film project that introduces the Aboriginal community. You know, the work of the uh, Anti-Racism Committee and, and, and others is certainly recognize that there's, a, uh, there's not a, as great an understanding of, of the Aboriginal community um, uh, in the broader community as, as we would like. And, you know, uh, understanding uh, one another uh, reads a... a uh, better relationships, and that's and that's our interest. The premiere is expected to take place at the auditorium this January. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. Thunder Bay man who was the subject of a Canada-wide warrant has surrendered to police. The arrest warrant for 62-year-old Arthur Joseph Lyons was first issued back on August 2nd. He finally turned himself in yesterday afternoon after having a third party contact police. Officers took him into custody a short time later at a south side location. Lyons is facing charges of sexual assault, sexual interference, and breach of probation. He made a preliminary court appearance earlier today. The Thunder Bay Public Library is looking to make some major changes. and is looking for the public's help in guiding it along the way. 
The library had just released a new strategic plan, but before finalizing the document, they're looking for input that will result in a big increase in the use of the library service. Cheryl Holmes has more. Lifelong learning, economic support, and fostering the well-being of a community. Those are the three key points of Thunder Bay Public Library's new strategic plan. It's a plan that also aims to embrace change and innovation within the library and amongst its users. Well, there's a direction there around social inclusion and, and diversity, which means we want more and different kinds of people using the service in the future. Right now, 40% of Thunder Bay residents use the library. Pateman hopes the strategic plan will help increase those numbers to as high as 60 or even 80 percent. Currently, over 75 percent of library users are women, and the majority of those users are 30 to 54 years old. A community action panel will be formed by the year's end to get input on what changes should be made to make the service more attractive. There's been good levels of engagement, lots of interest. Uh, the library service is highly used and highly valued by the community and the fact we're giving them more control over where it goes in the future has been very well received. Every, everything is good for change, right? Because the city is changing a lot, lots of things are coming up and I think that the library should have a, a good part in the changing thing. Input, that's what, it, that's what it's all about, yeah. Uh, uh, I. Uh, like I said, the only change I can think of is on Sunday. Yeah. Other, other than that, it's, it's, it's good. I'm satisfied with the library service, yeah. The strategic action plan will be carried out until 2016. Copies of the plan and the community panel application form are available online and at any library location throughout the city. Cheryl Holmes, TVT News. Fort William Historical Park and the MNR are trying to determine what animal is responsible for the death of some of the livestock at the park. The incidents have forced the uh, tourist attraction to take extra measures in order to protect their farm animals. The days of running free across the pasture unsupervised are over for these animals. The predator has claimed four sheep and seven chickens so far and is still on the loose, and there is only speculation as to what it might be. Employees at the fort discovered the aftermath of the first attack near the end of July. A week later, the animal struck again. Since then, they've been keeping a close eye on their animals and locking them up at night had bear sightings here this year. Uh, over the years we've had uh, wildlife coming, uh, so it could be foxes, it could be large birds, uh, you know, we really don't know. But we are uh, working with the people that do know uh, uh, and uh, the agencies that are responsible for this and, and professionals in this area. The investigation will continue until the predator is caught or leaves the area. The North Shore Steelhead Association has begun working to rehabilitate a small local brook trout creek. George Creek was heavily impacted during the construction of Centennial Park. The result has been a significant loss in the spawning productivity and available fish, fish habitat. Project manager Frank Edgson says they want to return the stream to its natural design. Once complete, it will offer fish refuge for high and low water situations in the current river. He says the project is a great way to educate the general public on the importance of small creeks. What we're attempting to do is to uh, dig out the uh, substrate that's uh currently in the stream and to replace it with uh, smaller rock and uh, more uh, substrates that are appropriate to brook trout. Uh, it's overgrown, it's filled in with organic materials and uh, we're going to sort of uh, repair that. We'll build some pools and riffles and uh, natural bends and meanders and have it look more like a brook trout stream. Construction began yesterday and is scheduled to be complete by the end of this month. Anyone interested in helping with the project can visit the North Shore Steelhead Association's website or contact Frank Edgen. Well, they're a part of everyday life and in just about any electronic device you can think of. The 16th Annual Semiconductor Conference is being held here in Thunder Bay this week. and People from across Canada are attending. More than 100 professors, researchers and industry partners are in the city sharing research and building new relationships. It's the hope that this conference will bring new high-tech commercial opportunities to Thunder Bay. Some of these commercial uses include solar cells, LED lighting, and semiconductor lasers. Dr. Al Resnick, a physics professor at Lincoln University, says the technology is a vital part of medical imaging. Uh, currently, diagnosis is based on imaging, so it's much better uh, to diagnose if uh, you can uh, image or visualize uh, the disease, right? So all imaging detectors are based on semiconductors. Resnick says institutions like Lakehead University and the Regional Research Institute help to bring this week-long conference to the city.
A well-known member of the Thunder Bay broadcasting community has died. Ron Bodis passed away this weekend at St. Joseph's Hospice. Bodis, for many years, was a highly popular announcer on CKPR Radio. He was also very active in front of the cameras, serving as host as the long-running quiz show Reach for the Top and the annual Mother's Day CF Telethon. Ron was also active in the local musical community, performing for years with the band Stone Ridge and was well known in the local construction industry. Ron Bodis was 71 years old. Good friend to many of us here at Dougal Media. He'll be sadly miss our condolences to the Bodis family. Turning to weather now, uh, Matt, uh, cloudy, chilly day. I'm getting pretty sick and tired of those clouds. Let me tell you, uh, any sunshine in the forecast? There is some sunshine in the forecast, Ryan, which is good news. The good news today, too, is that it didn't rain, right? We have to, we have to think of that as a positive as well right now. If you have a look uh, at the radar uh, today as well, we had that cloud, that cloud cover that kept things cool for the most part today. A little bit unexpected. We expected to see a little bit more sunshine than we did without that sunshine. That's what kept things uh, nice and cool uh, in the city and for most parts of the region today. Having a look at what's happening across the region right now. Marathon, 16 degrees. Greenstone, 15. Nice temperatures along the North Shore. Mostly cloudy skies as well, but uh, again, they did see some sunshine. 15 down in Sault Ste. Marie as we have a look uh, out west. Kenora, 18 degrees, as is Fort Francis. The hot spot right now up in Big Trout Lake, 21 degrees. They're enjoying some temperatures up in the northern part of the region, but they are under some uh, mostly cloudy skies up there. Here in the, in the city today, we reached a high of 18. Again, mostly cloudy skies. A little bit of wind to speak of, but it gusted up to 20 kilometers an hour. Not too bad, but again, it was that cloud cover that kept things cool uh, today. We should see that dissipate over the course of this week, uh, but I'll have more details on that in just a little bit tonight. Low, dropping down to 6 degrees tonight. It's going to be chilly. Might want to close those windows tonight. The good news is that this should be the last night that we're going to see temperatures drop that low. They're going to rise just a little bit, so things are not going to be as chilly. We could see some fog moving in as well. Uh, about 11 o'clock tonight, that's that will last until about the 5, 6 a.m. region. So again, keep that in mind uh, if you're driving or going anywhere uh, over the course of tonight. Uh, Wednesday, tomorrow, we're in this nice dome, this high pressure system that's going to bring a lot of sunshine, as Ryan just mentioned as well. Going to bring some sunshine, going to bring some heat. Those thunderstorms are going to stay to the west of us, pass down uh, through the United States. And uh, hey, you have to be happy about that. We're in that nice dome. We have some nice weather coming. I'll have more details on that coming up later in the news hour. And we can hardly wait for it to arrive. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Matt. Well, the audit details from Pamela Wallen were finally released today. Details on that story and more for you as your news hour continues. We found aspects of the Deloitte report uh, very troubling.
The audit into Senator Pamela Wallen's expenses was finally made public today. The Senate committee that went over the audit has ordered Wallen to repay tens of thousands of dollars. And she's become the fourth senator this year whose expenses have been referred to the RCMP. Julie Van Dusen has the details. No sign of Senator Pam Wallen this morning as her fellow senators gathered to decide what to do with a damning audit of her travel expenses. They concluded it needed to be referred to the RCMP. We found aspects of the Deloitte report uh, very troubling. Last night, Wallen made a statement calling the audit unfair, but promised to pay back all of the disputed money and then some. I will pay back the full amount ordered by the committee, including interest. The amount of ineligible expenses, according to the audit, is $121,348, of which Wallen has already reimbursed $38,000. A further amount, nearly $21,000, is subject to more scrutiny by the Senate. A key problem, Wallen's stopovers at her Toronto condo on her way to her home province of Saskatchewan. The Deloitte audit determined 75 out of 94 trips from Ottawa to Saskatchewan involve stopovers of one or more nights in Toronto. Some of these stopovers were unrelated to Senate business. And she also billed the Senate for some partisan events like this election rally in Saskatoon. Deloitte disallowed the $230 she charged the Senate for driving from her home in Wadena, Saskatchewan to the Conservative event. She sent in expense claims that said she was on Senate business. When they were reviewed, we found that in fact some of them were not Senate business. The audit also found inconsistencies in Wallen's electronic calendar submissions. She said she was told to change the calendar, but Senator David Tkachuk says not so. What I told her to do was submit all relevant material. Don't submit irrelevant material. That's all. That was her decision to make after that what was relevant and what isn't. Senator Gerald Como, who sits as a Conservative, was asked if Wallen could ever be welcomed back into the Tory fold. Well, would you like to see her back? Uh, we'll see what happens. Liberal Senator George Fury says the past few months have been tough on the Senate. The colleagues that I spoke to uh, during the summer tell me that everywhere they go, they're being uh, mocked. In addition to all of the money that must be repaid, Pamela Wallen has been told that she can only build a Senate for direct flights between Ottawa and Saskatchewan, and that all of her travel expenses will be closely monitored for a year. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. Protesters descended on Toronto Police Headquarters today, still not satisfied with the force's response to the police shooting of a teenager on a streetcar. Ron Charles reports. Justice for Sammy! Justice for Sammy! Today's Justice rally shows just how strong the public Sammy. outrage remains two weeks after this. The streetcar shooting of 18-year-old Sammy Yatim by a Toronto police officer. Yatim had a knife but was alone on the streetcar when the officer shot at him nine times. What do we want? Justice! Sammy Yatim's mother and sister showed up to the rally but said they are still too grief-stricken to talk. Today's rally is the second since the shooting, still attracting people shocked by the video. To show, show support for a child who was killed, a young man that was killed, and I mean, I think everybody's seen the video and there's no question that it was unwarranted. I came to support the family because I feel very sorry about what happened to their child. Toronto's police chief has already tried to respond to this public outrage. Yesterday, he took the extraordinary step of naming a retired judge to look into how and when his officers use force against people in emotional crisis. I want to ensure that we take as thorough a look at this as possible. The protesters did not seem to be convinced of that. They marched to Toronto's police headquarters and the monthly meeting of the city's police services board, the politicians and civilians who oversee the force. Shame! Recommendations have been made. Earlier at a news conference, family members of other people shot by police said they expect little from the chief's review. You know, I look back at all the inquests that happened before O'Brien's death, O'Brien's inquest that I spent many days in, and all the recommendations that came out of that inquest, 
And again, nothing was done. You are the voice of the people. Outside police headquarters, protesters continue to express their anger at what they call police success. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. A horrific accident on a busy Toronto bus route. One person is dead following a serious bus crash in uptown Toronto. The bus was stopped at an intersection when a cube van smashed into the transit vehicle. A woman was killed waiting to exit the bus. The crash also took out a telephone pole, briefly knocking out power to about 5,000 customers in the area. The railway involved in the Lac Megantic disaster is losing its license. The Canadian Transportation Agency says the Montreal, Maine and Atlantic Railway doesn't have enough third-party liability insurance, and it says MM&A hasn't been able to prove that it can pay for it. The order is effective August 20th. At least 47 people were killed when the train derailed and exploded in a small eastern Quebec town. The agency also said it will launch a review of its insurance rules this fall to ensure they're adequate for what it calls catastrophic events. A prisoner released today in the Middle East. Israel has released dozens of Palestinian prisoners as part of a deal to resume peace talks. Protesters huddled outside a prison in central Israel before the release. They're demanding the government release Israeli prisoners instead. Earlier today, the country's high court rejected an appeal by the protesters. Israel plans to free over 100 Palestinian inmates ahead of the U.S.-led peace talks, which are scheduled to start tomorrow. It's an argument many in this area will be familiar with. The debate over the grizzly bear hunt is back on in Alberta. It's been three years since the province listed grizzlies as a threatened species. Now a project monitoring their activity has some thinking it's time to start hunting the bears again. Brian Labby has the story. It's a routine Andrea Moorhouse is getting used to. She's in charge of the grizzly bear monitoring project here in southwestern Alberta. She's headed into the woods but stops to point out a fresh bear track, possibly from a grizzly. Some of the claw marks potentially in here. Further up the path, she reaches tree number 805, which is wrapped in barbed wire. Morehouse collects a hair sample, one more piece of evidence that seems to show there are more grizzlies here. I think it's exciting, yes. <laughs> Hundreds of these so-called rub sites have been set up in forested areas and for the first time on public and private property. They snag hair from the grizzlies and DNA analysis is showing that the numbers have nearly tripled. More than was previously estimated. The last survey done in this area showed a population estimate of 51 grizzlies. The number now is at least 122. That's the minimum number, it's not the population estimate. Uh, so the population estimate would be higher than that because certainly we didn't detect every single grizzly bear that used the area. The numbers may or may not include grizzlies who visited this feed site last spring, an area that's used to draw bears away from nearby ranches where the carnivores sometimes attack or feed on dead cattle. Ranchers are relieved to hear the survey numbers. They say it proves what they've known for a while. They were seeing bears where they hadn't seen them before in greater numbers than they'd seen them before. Jeff Bechtel ranches in the Cardston area. He says the survey will likely renew the debate about bringing back the bear hunt. He believes hunting can play a limited role. It wouldn't be open season on bears. I can't imagine that happening. You know, hopefully there's a, there's a way to manage the overall population at a reasonable level and, and a way to manage bears that prove themselves to be habitual uh, offenders. Yep, there's some... Morehouse's research will continue for another year before a decision is made on what to do with all these new visitors. Brian Labby, CBC News, near Pincher Creek. Let's take a look at today's market activity now. In Toronto, the TSX up 48 points to 12,642. The Dow posted a 31-point gain, climbing to 15,451. The Nasdaq was up 14 points to 3684. Canadian dollar closed at 96.68 cents U.S. That's down almost four tenths. Gold lost over $13 to fall to $1,320 an ounce. And oil was up 72 cents to 106.83 a barrel.
Well, as we move ever closer to a new academic year, interest in varsity sports at Lakehead University is ramping up. And one team there's a lot of optimism surrounding is the new uh, LU basketball, women's basketball. Yeah, team. they struggled last year, 7-9 and nine record. They particularly had a tough time when they matched up against bigger teams. Mm -hmm. So now one of their off-season priorities is to add some muscle to their lineup. They feel they've done that with the addition of a couple of six-foot post players, Thunder Bay's Jillian Lavoie and Essa Jacobson of Grand Marais. Jacobson in particular is expected to battle for big minutes at the position, which was a bit of a revolving door last season. She does have some work to do, however, if she hopes to crack the starting lineup. Last year's Thunderwolves team relied primarily on speed and perimeter shooting with limited success, as they often found themselves out-muscled by bigger opponents. They're hoping first-year post Essa Jacobson can help change that this season. That's what we need this year is more size and not only height but also a little more uh, muscle in the post. She just gives us that toughness, grit. Uh, player is not afraid to use her elbows and uh, get on the floor. Um, and she's, she's solid, tough, strong, great rebounder. Rebounding is arguably the strongest part of the Grand Marais, Minnesota Natives game. She grabbed 1,444 of them at Cook County High School. That's a school record. She's the only player in school history with more than 1,000 points and 1,000 boards. In two years of junior college, she was two-time All-State, but that's against an admittedly lower level of competition. When I first came up here, I was like, well, it's faster and bigger and everyone's better. And even during a brief off-season workout, Jacobson quickly realized she's got some things to improve upon if she hopes to make an impact in CIS. I think I'm strong, but I need to be more like finesse and get better with moves and developing my game, I guess, in the post. A player that still needs to get in shape a little bit, but she, when she gets there, she'll be, uh, you know, battling it out for that, for, probably for that starting position. She's playing for a team that attempted and made more three-pointers than any other in the country last year. That, she says, should help her out offensively. It does a lot because even if I get stuck down low, I know I can depend on a shooter outside. Now, if that inside game can develop and take some pressure off the Thunderwolves shooters, it will drastically improve the team's chances to once again become OUA playoff contenders. Well, former Lakehead Thunderwolves assistant Jeremy Aduno has taken over the reins behind the bench of the Thunder Bay North Stars. It's Aduno's first head coaching job. He spoke after this weekend's open tryouts about putting together a roster and goals for the upcoming campaign. I don't think our expectations right now are, are very specific. I think uh, the biggest thing right now is we want to identify the best talent uh, here in Thunder Bay and in the region. Um, I know my biggest objective, uh, as, well as, my, as well as my assistant Colin and, and our management and our ownership, uh, you know, we obviously want to be competitive. Uh, number one, you always want to be competitive, but we're also big on development. Um, you know, we're, we're all in it for the, for the same reason, where we want kids uh, from Thunder Bay and regional kids uh, to be able to develop and become better players, better people, and, you know, have the chance to move on to, uh, to better opportunities. So I think that right now is our main uh, expectation and goal coming this season. The team held tryouts over the weekend at Port Arthur Arena. All eligible returning players also took part in the practices. The new head coach was impressed by the high level of competition, considering many of the kids haven't had much ice time over the past few months. Aduno also spoke about his relationship with Trevor Latowski, the former NHLer who's now the head coach of the OHL's Sarnia Sting, and how that friendship can help him in his new position. He is one of my best friends. Yeah. He has been uh, kind of my whole life. And uh, actually, he was at the, the skate this morning. It was nice. He came out, and uh, Nick Latta uh, from Sarnia, who's uh, you know one of their top guys, also came out today. So that was kind of a treat for some of our guys to see that. And uh, you know, I thank Nick and Trevor uh, for making that happen. Um, but yeah, Trevor and I talk all the time, uh, you know, about life and about hockey. And uh, it was kind of funny after the practice today. I think we uh, we both showed each other a couple drills that we like and uh, started talking systems. We had to we had to put a cork in it before uh, before it got too late. But I think him and I will be in touch a lot this year, and uh, we'll definitely use each other as a resource. Turning to baseball now, it was a rough summer for the Thunder Bay Border Cats. They posted their worst ever second half win total, finishing at 8-27 and, and recorded their fewest overall wins with just 21 for the season. Offensively, the team really wasn't that bad, but as has been discussed at length over the past few months, their pitching, simply awful. First, team man first time manager Dan Holcomb discusses what he learned during his time in the Cats' dugout and whether he might be back next season. 
Uh, it, it feels great. I, I mean, I learned a lot. It, it's one of those things you never know what you're going to learn. You think you're going to learn a lot of X's and O's, and you're going to think you're uh, going to learn tons about the game. And uh, I'll tell you, you learn a lot about the guys. Uh, I mean, you learn a lot about players and how to motivate them. Uh, you learn a lot about, you know, how to, you know, get guys on a daily basis here to get ready to play a game. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things you don't necessarily think of as an assistant, but, uh, you know, that's the things you learn. And, and I can tell you, I think our guys got better throughout the year and, you know, it definitely shows offensively. I would love to be. I love the Thunder Bay uh, city. I mean, everybody here has been great to me. Uh, Brad and Brian have been tremendous. Uh, the Jorgensen family has been awesome. Uh, but I know that's a conversation that I'll have to have with Brad and Brian uh, throughout the uh, course of the next week or so and, and kind of see where they're at and uh, see where they want to take the program. There was a rare celebration in Moscow for Canadian track and field fans today. Medal winning performances have brought new hope for Canada on the world athletic scene. Peter Armstrong explains. Then Brianna Tyson Eaton. For the first time in a long time, a Canadian in the hunt for a medal at the World Championships. Heptathlete Brianne Tyson Eaton had a shot at gold. In the stands, her nervous entourage included her husband, American Ashton Eaton, who won gold in the men's decathlon just yesterday. Tyson Eaton there has hit the front. After a final heat in which eight of ten racers posted a personal best, the 24-year-old Canadian would have to settle for silver. A well-earned, long-dreamt-of result at the pinnacle of world racing. Only two other Canadian women have medaled at an outdoor event. Tyson Eaton now joins the elite ranks of women's racing alongside Perdita Felicien and Priscilla Lopez-Schleep. She's still upset she fell short of gold, but as she watched the Canadian flag hoisted into second position, Tyson Eaton says she started getting emotional. You know, you think of all the hard work you did, but I guess you think of your country, your family, how many people are probably watching at home, how excited they are. Her win, also Canada's win, and not the only one. Damian Warner took bronze in the men's decathlon. Both young, promising athletes, both now considered serious medal hopefuls in the next Summer Olympics. I think this is a real breakthrough moment. <laughs> Mike Smith knows all about breakthroughs. It's been 20 years since he was climbing the podium himself. He says this is a moment Canada has been waiting for. Well, it really is an exciting time. To have two uh, Canadian athletes on the podium at a World Championships is a, is a rare thing. And uh, it's many, many years in between since we've seen it. And there's no question this country needed a boost. Canada is currently 14th in the medal count just ahead of Botswana. But success like this brings new attention, new sponsorship money, and new fans to the sport. Just what athletes here need with two years to go before the next Summer Olympics. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Meanwhile, the Lakehead University running team is well represented at the Canada Summer Games. Travis Rosk, running for Saskatchewan, and Connor McGuire, running for PEI, have qualified for the 1,500-meter final. McGuire will also run in the men's 5,000-meter race on Friday. Danielle Teal, running for Saskatchewan, will be in the 5,000-meter women's race, also set for Friday. To the MLB, where the Minnesota Twins have reportedly placed Canadian first baseman Justin Morneau on revocable waivers, according to several media sources. Uh, any team that claims him will have a, shot, a short window of time to finalize a trade with the Twins, or Minnesota could pull Morneau back and keep him in the lineup. The Twins can also let the claiming team keep Morneau without any compensation, should they so choose. The 32-year-old is hitting 262 this season with 14 home runs and 67 RBI. His numbers are up in August after slumping in July. There are a couple of teams that are rumored to be interested. So a little bit of a fall from grace for Justin Morneau. Big, big contract numbers attached to Morneau. Yes. I think he has one more year to go on that deal. So mm -hmm. uh, tough decision if any team wants to pick him up. Injury yeah. issues too, right? Yeah, yeah. Back to back injury concerns well. years, yep. really what derailed him. Yeah. Thanks, Benaz. Tonight on uh, Global Thunder Bay, a double dip of NCIS and on CKPR, Rick uh, goes to bat at the women's fast-paced champ Fast Pitch Championship. There you go. Here's Stella Talk. Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, starting at 8, it's NCIS. And Ziva questions her father's motives when he unexpectedly visits. Then on NCIS Los Angeles, Kenzie and Deeks investigate the theft of a cartel boss's body. And at 10 on Haven, Audrey tries to determine the cause of a series of incidents involving butterflies. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay at 7.30, grab a cuppa with the gang from Coronation Street.
Then at 8, Rick goes to bat in the Women's Fast Pitch Championship on the Rick Mercer Report. At 8.30 on 22 Minutes, it's Don Cherry's game day thoughts on Republicans and Democrats. And at 9, Bobby helps out when a jealous ex-husband kidnaps Connor on Arctic Air. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists. Well, it's a little bit chilly here and a little bit cloudy, but luckily there's no rain to speak of. Not the case in other parts of the country, Matt. Definitely not, Holly. Some unsettled weather uh, across, well, right across the country from the west coast to the east coast. Uh, I'll get to that in just a minute. Thunder Bay today, we did he see a high of 18 degrees, mostly cloudy skies, as I mentioned earlier. Those cloudy skies kept things rather cool. Our high was supposed to be, we're supposed to get up a little bit more into the 20s today, but those, that cloud cover kept things rather chilly. As we have a look at what's happening across the country, Vancouver, 22 degrees, Prince George at 20 six beautiful skies there but meteorologists are tracking a storm that's about 70 kilometers southwest of old alberta right now so edmonton 23 and calgary at 25 but that storm system there's all kinds of warnings through northeastern british columbia down into the city of calgary all down through alberta into the southern southwest parts of saskatchewan hail possible hail damaging winds so that could be uh, some unsettled weather for them uh, early like later evening tonight as uh, we move into the prairie, Saskatoon 26, Regina 24. Beautiful skies there as well. They are seeing some sunshine. We have a look at Winnipeg right now as well, 22 degrees. Churchill 25, lucky Churchill. They uh, are up uh, in the mid-20s right now as we move into southern Ontario. Toronto 16 degrees, mostly cloudy skies in southern Ontario right now. Ottawa, they just had a rainfall warning end for them. They are going to see some showers tonight uh, as well and uh, into this evening, as will Quebec City as well. They're mostly cloudy skies, but they're going to see uh, some rain for this evening as well. Moving into the Maritimes, Halifax, seeing some rain 
Also in Charlottetown, cloudy skies. There's another rainfall warning just uh, north up here in Quebec uh, that could see uh, some more unsettled weather. And that warning continues into St. John's, uh, into the Avalon, Avalon Peninsula. They're going to have a rainfall warning right now, and that will continue for the next couple of hours. So again, some unsettling weather, as Holly just mentioned, too, uh, across the country. As we have a look at our systems map today, we have that cold front. That's what's going to keep things cool tonight and into tomorrow. And it, as we move into Thursday, that's what's going to push everything out. And that's where our beautiful skies are going to come. No precipitation in the forecast until we get to the weekend. But again, once we get there, it does remain low. As we have a look at uh, tonight, what's going to happen across the region. 7 degrees, 8 degrees. A lot of the parts of the region are going to see the same weather as Thunder Bay. Those cool, cool temperatures. Even out to the west, Kenora is going to stay at 10 but they're one of the only places it's going to remain in the double digits. Uh, so look out at 9, uh, at a Coken at 6 as well. But come tomorrow, that beautiful weather is what we're going to see. 23, 22, 20s across the board and sunshine just about everywhere. Big Trout Lake 23, 23, uh, the prevailing temperature across the region. Today, right now at Thunder Bay this hour, 17 degrees, mostly cloudy skies. As I mentioned tonight, we're going to drop down to a low of 6. So I mentioned this earlier, 6 degrees. With that possible fog, what that means is that we're going to reach the dew point tonight. So with some of that warm air, that's what's going to create that fog. All that water vapor very close to the ground. That's going to be between about 11 o'clock tonight and 5 o'clock tomorrow morning. So again, be careful on the roads tonight if you do see some of that fog. Uh, out there as well as we have a look at your day tomorrow partly cloudy skies in the morning 21 22 degrees by tomorrow afternoon a beautiful day for the middle of the week and as we look uh, at uh, the five day forecast moving into thursday 25 25 partly sunny skies and sunny skies on friday you have to you can't complain about that that's for sure as we have a look into your weekend 26 degrees 24 degrees on sunday on saturday and sunday there's a 30 or 40 percent chance of rain of showers but again that's a pretty minimal chance at this point beautiful Beautiful temperatures, so it's going to be a good late part of the week, early weekend, to go out and have some fun, get outside, do something outdoors, because the weather looks fantastic. It's time for this week's visit to the Thunder Bay and District Humane Society. Tonight, Fiona Gardner introduces us to a pair of cats named Zoe and Lexi. Hi, I'm Fiona Gardner and this week's Humane Society Pet of the Week is kind of a twofer. We've got a couple of three month old uh, domestic medium hair kittens who have uh, come here as strays and now they're looking for a home. This is Zoe and this is Lexi. And these girls are what you would call, I guess, teenagers. So uh, they like to explore, but they're very friendly. They like each other, they like other cats, and uh, they love kids and people and a chance to uh, see the world. So if these would be a great addition to your home, drop by the Humane Society and come and meet Zoe and Lexi today. Your Pet of the Week has been brought to you by Thunder Pet. Expert advice and high quality pet food within your budget. Coming up, a disturbing story to tell you about one of those things that's apt to keep some people up at night. It's bunnies that glow in the dark. Stay with us. <laughs>
Well, our next story, you've got to see it to believe it. Take a look. This looks like a regular old batch of bunny rabbits. That's until the lights go up. That's right. Oh. These baby rabbits Come are on. glowing in the dark. Turkish scientists injected fluorescent protein from jellyfish DNA into some of the embryos. And when mama rabbit gave birth, two of the bunnies glowed in the dark. Now, the real goal was to prove a new genetic manipulation technique works efficiently. The glowing port, sort of a fun fringe benefit, if you're into that sort of thing. Either way, it's enlightening medical research. And it has given the world what it really needs, bunny nightlights. <laughs> that is horrible. I, it is. I, said, I feel it so is bad disturbing. for those bunnies. It is. <laughs> I think it's kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. A bunny nightlight? That says something about your state of mind. Well, <laughs> well okay. Well, whatever. Moving yeah. on. How about we recap our top story? Well, the Lyceum Theater will no longer be demolished. Last night, Council made the decision to repair the roof and do some upgrading inside the facility instead of knocking it down that was originally scheduled. In sports tonight, the Toronto Blue Jays come in 10 games below uh, 500, but they can make a little bit of headway in the uh, AL East as the first place Boston Red Sox come to town. We yeah. hope. That's highly. all very exciting. I'll have the highlights for you coming up on the late edition. Not to be negative, but I highly doubt it. Uh, <laughs> Weather-wise, chilly night tonight, beautiful day tomorrow. UV index of 6 for tomorrow as well, which I forgot to mention. So uh, beautiful couple days ahead. Let's hope. Yep. That'll do it for tonight's look at news, weather, and sports. Thank you all for being with us, and we'll see you again tomorrow.